In this episode of the Business of E-Commerce, I talk with Brian Miller about how COVID-19 has affected shipping and supply chain from China. This is the Business of E-Commerce, episode 127. Welcome to the Business of E-Commerce, the show that helps e-commerce retailers start, launch, and grow their e-commerce business. I'm your host, Charles Bolesky, and I'm here today with Brian Miller. Brian is the founder of Easy China Warehouse, a third-party logistics company in Shenzhen. I asked Brian on the show today to talk about how COVID-19 has affected shipping and supply chain from China. So, hey, Brian, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Awesome to have you in the show. Um, super interested in this topic. I feel like obviously kind of COVID right now, everyone's kind of talking about it, but seeing that from the eyes of how it affects e-commerce, I think we've all kind of felt it. But so you're on the ground right now in China, right? And you've been there for a while. Yeah. So, yeah, so our company is located in Shenzhen, China, which is this in the south of China. If people are familiar with Hong Kong, we actually border Hong Kong. So uh, a lot of people probably know Hong Kong over Shenzhen, and that's where we are right now. And Shenzhen is basically the shipping capital of the, the world at this point, right? I know they're one of the big. Yeah, yeah, it's one of the shipping capitals. It's also one of the um, hardware capitals of the world. So most of the hardware in the world is actually manufactured out of Shenzhen. Um, and most of the big companies that we know that make hardware, like Apple, uh, any of the Bluetooth speaker companies, uh, computer manufacturers are all here. So uh, it's an important uh, supply base for that type of manufacturing as well. Okay. So this episode will come out next week, but we're talking right here on probably good to know May 12th, uh, 2020, right? In case someone looks back at this. So because... <laughs> This topic's moving quick, right? Like everything we say this week is very different than last week and last month, right? But you've been, you've kind of been seeing this since the very beginning, since what, January, right? Chinese New Year? Yeah. So around that time, basically in December, when I was in China um, in in 19, uh, we kind of heard a little bit about a virus that was around and people didn't know much about it. And that we shouldn't be that concerned. And at that time, no one really knew what it was about. And actually, at the end of January, it was when the Chinese government made a formal announcement uh, that there was this virus, the coronavirus that we know today. Um, and so in January is when kind of the ramp up of everyone starting to, you know, try to protect themselves with masks and kind of stay inside started in China. Gotcha. And now at this point, so in May, what, what are we looking at in China? How are things going there right now? Yeah. So luckily, I mean, up until now, um, you know, the first few months definitely in China were tough. Um, but as of today in May, uh, I'd say that like most of the production is back online. Uh, so if you do make things in China, uh, it's easy to uh, release orders to your factory. And actually factories are kind of hungry for orders right now because because of the demand shock in the rest of the world where the virus has kind of spread to other places, now there's a demand shock from those places and um, there's less buyers releasing orders in China. So factories are having a bit of a, a hard time in China and they're very hungry for your order now, for sure. Is it the demand is lower right now or it's the shipping is more difficult? And kind of How is the shipping right now, like actually getting stuff out of China? Yeah, so I would say like, like the, the virus kind of... Um, came and it affected the supply chain in, in two different ways. So uh, when we had the ramp up in China, up to so Chinese New Year changes every year, but this year in 2020, it started at the end of January. And so that's also kind of in line with when the virus was the most severe in China. And so we had kind of a whole lockdown and we had a lot of things that happened, uh, temperature check, people had to stay home. Um, and the government kind of uh, created kind of a strict quarantine enforcement uh, throughout the whole country. And um, after Chinese New Year, uh, when factories tried to get back online, basically there were new safety requirements that all uh, factories and warehouses like us needed to abide by in order to open. And we needed to have actually Chinese state uh, uh, government inspectors come to our facility to allow us to commence operation. And as you can imagine, if you have millions of factories in China and everyone's applying to get back to work, well, you needed to wait in line for a safety inspector to come to your facility and approve you to go. And so that's right after Chinese New Year in February. That's where we saw a lot of 
uh, supply constraints. And by supply, I mean the manufacturing base was slow to get started. And people that were releasing orders started to see delays in February because a lot of the factories were saying that they were open, but in fact, they were actually getting open and they weren't to full capacity. So there was uh, the safety inspections, but also the quarantine throughout the country uh, kind of hindered the ability for factories to get labor. So in China, actually a lot of labor that works in factory comes from the countryside and there are migrant workers that come to the cities, like large cities, to actually work in the factories. And because of the quarantines, uh, factories were under capacity in their ability to get labor to produce. So in February, we saw massive factory delays. And then in March, we saw most of the factories start to open. And probably by the end of the March, we saw at least 80% of the capacity come back online. So that's kind of like the timeline that we saw in manufacturing uh, within China. So first it was the supply constraint, and now at this point in May, we have like a demand constraint, meaning like kind of, you know, economies have contracted because people have to stay home. People are not spending as much money. People are not out consuming as much. And so we're seeing that, you know, factories are a little bit light on orders in China at the moment. Today's episode is sponsored by Drip. Drip is the world's first e-commerce CRM and a tool that I personally use for email marketing and automation. Now, if you're ever in an e-commerce store, you need to give Drip a try. And here's why. Drip offers one-click integrations for both Shopify and Magento. There's robust segmentation, personalization, and revenue dashboards to give you an overview of how your automation emails are performing. One of my favorite features of Drip is the Visual Workflow Builder. It gives you a super easy way to build out your automation rules visually and see the entire process. It lets you get started quickly, but also build very complex automation rules. It's powerful, but also easy to learn, unlike a lot of email tools that offer the same type of automation. To get a demo of Drip today, you can go head over to drip.com slash BOE. That's drip.com slash BOE. Now onto the show. Okay. And how is shipping coming out of China then at this point too? Because that's, you know, must have been hit both. We were talking earlier about both sea and air. Um, I'm guessing they've done yeah. drastic changes. Yeah. So um, a little bit about shipping is um, coming from China at least the biggest problem that everyone's had is basically air shipping. Um, a lot of people don't realize that about 50% of all air freight capacity is uh, shipped in the bellies of passenger flights. And so since most of the flights around the world are canceled, uh, basically 50% of global air freight capacity has been wiped off the market. Um, and in addition, because of the um, factory delays in February, a lot of buyers wanted to get their products to their markets as fast as possible because, you know, we had delays in production and they were running out of inventory. And so you had a massive demand of people trying to put their product on air freight aircraft. Um, and that caused basically a, a squeeze in, in the capacity and a, a very high increase in demand. And so since February, our air freight prices have gone up almost every week until last week, they just went down a little bit, but we've never seen air freight prices ever so high in my whole entire time manufacturing in China. So it's kind of unprecedented. And we as a shipping company have had trouble even getting our products onto aircraft. So a lot of our freight, our air freight is actually sitting at the airport in Hong Kong waiting in line. So it's first come first serve. You put your product there and they load your product into the available aircraft as it's available. Um, so we're seeing like even one week waiting times to get our products loaded onto aircraft. Wow. So there's a massive constraint in this market at the moment. So for anyone that's shipping from China, manufacturing in China, or drop shipping, it's been a huge um, uh, change in their business because um, it's the costs have increased. Some of the sales of certain products have become unviable because of the high cost of air freight. And also shipping times have slowed down. So for anyone drop shipping from China to the rest of the world, a lot of them are having problems with like, you know, 30 plus day delivery times, which is, you know, not normal. So there's a lot of constraints on this market at the moment. Yeah. I feel like the direct drop shipping from China, shipping times are always an issue. And now it's just yeah. 10x that, like, you know, whatever problems we we're facing before are now just exacerbated by this. 
Yeah, we're seeing like in normal times, we usually see around one to two weeks. Um, and now we're seeing uh, it could be over 30 days for we have different shipping lines. But for like the regular uh, postal shipments, you know, some places are over 30 days. And and so a lot of these e-commerce sellers are having trouble managing that expectation with their customer, managing returns and and all those things. So it's it's become a big problem for the drop the direct from China drop shipping market at the moment. If you were a drop shipper, any kind of tips there on dealing with that? Is it just kind of managing customer expectations at this point? Or is, it, is there any way to get it there quicker? Or is it just what it is right now? Yeah, there is a bit. I mean, for, for at least for our company, we and, and other companies offer a product called a direct line. And the basic idea of the direct line is that we label the product with a USPS label in China. And then we consolidate the air freight on our own to the U.S. where we pass it on to USPS. And so this method, although it's a bit more expensive than the average um, postal shipment, it's uh, more stable in its shipment time because we're actually setting up the air freight, right? The postal shipments that many of the drop shippers use in China, those basically get loaded on the plane last because those are the <laughs> those are the um, the least. Uh, let's say they pay the least for that product for that space on the plane. And so everyone that's paying more like us or DHL or any other people are putting our products um, on the plane before those postal shipments. So there are a few methods. People are also using express now because air freight has become so expensive that even DHL is uh, just as competitive as a lot of the other shipment methods. So we've seen a lot of changes in the market in the last month or so. Okay, so by you basically pre-buying the postage at that point, you guys are first in line, everyone else kind of just goes in the uh, when we have space bin, and then they're just using those as kind of filler in between, more or less. Yeah, we have an account. Yeah, we have an account in the U.S. and we basically print those labels in China, and then we take like you know thousands of packages and consolidate them into our own air freight. Uh, that we manage to the U.S. and then pass it on to USPS. So we make sure that like it gets on a plane and we bring it to the U.S. and it gets passed off. Um, whereas if you ship with the post office, usually you're in the hands of whatever you know they're able to do. So you don't know where it is. You don't know how long it's going to take. And you can't really track or see your package at any time during the the, the, the shipment process. So you're basically controlling the whole container from start to finish versus they're just kind of controlling one, one package, one like small parcel, and that gets put in someone else's container yeah. and, yeah, find its way there. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like we're controlling the destiny of our, let's say, our customers' clients, whereas uh, the post office is putting it all together with a group of other people. And then when there's enough space on the plane, they put whatever they have allotted onto that plane. So say if they have like, um, let's say one ton available every day and they, but they have three tons of shipments that people give them every day. Well, eventually you get so much built up that it starts getting stuck in, <laughs> in China because there's so much backlog of product. Whereas, you know, if we have one ton, we buy one ton worth of, of shipment. If we have like two tons, we buy two tons worth of space. So we're like, you know, actively buying space on the aircraft to make sure that our stuff gets in, essentially. Got it. Okay. So if you're a small dropshipper out there, the only way to get in on this will be to work with a 3PL like yourself, right? Like there's no yeah, way you could do this like on your own. Yeah, you couldn't do it on your own. I mean, we do it and uh, obviously other people do it. So you could find uh, 3PLs in China. Um, not many people do it, but there are uh, uh, various uh, shippers that do do this type of method. So, yeah, you would have to find basically instead of buying from AliExpress, you would have to purchase your own small amount of product uh, from the factory directly and send it to one of those three PLs in China. And then they would help store it and then ship it for you when you had an order. So that's kind of how it would work. So uh, differing from traditional drop shipping where you could just order one or two units off AliExpress and you don't have to take as much risk, let's say, up front in the cost. Whereas with our model, you do have to buy some product and leave it at our warehouse. So there's a bit more capital risk, but at the same time, you get an advantage of better shipping times and, and a better customer experience for your customer. So it's like, you know, it's whatever balance you want to make for your business, basically. And I'm guessing with the kind of supply crunch right now, if you're 
a smaller drop shipper, you might be able to approach a factory now and the minimum is going to be less. They're going to be a lot more likely to kind of play ball with you versus if you went to them, you know, six months ago, you're going to, you're going to be competing against everyone. Versus now you could probably sneak in and just get a very small initial order and just kind of almost use now as an opportunity. It sounds like. Yeah, I completely agree. It's a great point. Like right now is a great time, whether you're looking for new suppliers or whether you have old suppliers to see if you can kind of renegotiate some terms, maybe get a better price or, you know, they might allow you to buy a lower quantity uh, more often. So it's a really good point because they are strained at the moment for orders. And so you as the buyer have a bit more leverage than they do. And I think it's a really good idea even, but obviously don't be too tough. Like, uh, they are in a tough time as well. And if you're too pushy, it might sour your relationship, but it doesn't hurt to like bring it up and ask them and see if you can get a better term for yourself. Yeah. How is, are people going more to see freight now? Cause it almost sounds like when you're talking like 30 plus days, you could almost just start going see at this point, right? Like it, it's going to get yeah, way cheaper. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it is a really good point. Like, um, so uh, that's just the drop shipping, but also like, um, I give you an example, like usually DHL or, or UPS, you can get an express shipment from China in three to four days. And now those same shipments are taking two weeks. So like we, we're really seeing like a really long shipment time and the cost is really high. And so, uh, because of that environment, it's made it kind of cost prohibitive for you to be you know, make a profit on your product. So a lot of people are choosing just to wait and to ship by sea instead of even thinking and just being out of inventory for a few weeks, people are kind of accepting this as the new norm in order to uh, keep their margins high. So yeah, we're seeing a lot of people just move to sea, even if they're out of inventory, they just have to wait and be out for a few weeks. Yeah. And people, I think right now are used to back orders are a thing. Um, you know, here in Boston, I can usually do Amazon one day, some you know for a lot of products, and it just turned into a week. It's just normal. You just wait. It's not a. It's just what you're used to now. So it is. We're kind of living in a different time right now. Yeah, I think consumers are a bit more uh, patient now, <laughs> uh, and understanding than what they used to be. Um, you know, before this all started. So yeah, so you can convince a customer to wait a week or two. Um, to get a product just because there's so much strain on the supply chain. Gotcha. How do you see, we were talking about this before the show, you know, everyone's looking right now and the U.S. is still, as of today, kind of on this lockdown. Certain states are opening back up and we kind of keep looking over at China seeing it looks like stuff's kind of getting back to normal there. How do you see like our curve versus that curve of things turning back to normal in the U.S.? Yeah, so I think I think this is a great question because um, – uh, since it started in China, people like to kind of make a prediction at, okay, what did, what happened in China and then what will happen with us? Um, but in addition to that, I think we need to focus also on just the re the actions of each government and then people can make a better, more uh, like kind of educated guess about what they think might happen. And so at least on China's side, when the virus started in January, within the first one to two weeks, we saw about the one, first week, we saw about half the population wear masks. And within the second week of January, we almost had the whole population wearing masks. OK, so it was a quick ramp up to the concern of this of society. And then along with that, we started to see temperature checks at all public places. So if I went into a supermarket, if I went into my own apartment building, uh, any mall would shut down all the doors except for one. And they would only allow one you know, door in to check people's temperature. Um, I had roadblocks where they would stop every car and do a temperature check. And even today to my warehouse facility, there's roadblocks on either side where every car gets checked on the way in every person in the car's temperature. And so uh, that kind of, you know, control and, and kind of uh, oversight really helped them kind of or at least help China find, um, you know, cases quickly and try to isolate those people as quickly as possible away from the rest of the population. Um, and in addition to that, they also required people to start registering on apps that we have on our phone. So we have our whole um, health history and our travel history on our phone that people can scan a QR code when I open my phone and they can see where I've been and what I've done and whether or not I'm high risk to a restaurant or anywhere that I want to go into. Um, 
And the last thing that I think is interesting to to, to know is I left uh, and I went to Thailand for a few weeks during the virus. And when I came back, I actually was required to partake in a 14 day mandatory quarantine at my house. And so how do they make that? I was brought to my, how do they know that? Well, okay. Yeah. So that's a great question. So, um, the cell phone companies in China, they work wow. with, um, a lot of the, uh, so they work with the government and basically when, when your phone, uh, when you go anywhere, your phone is constantly pinging a cell tower. And basically, um, when I walked into my building, they have me scan a QR code and the QR code basically tells that person where I've been for the last 14 days. It doesn't say the exact place, but it says, okay, I've been in Thailand or I've been in Shenzhen or I've been in Hong Kong for X amount of days. And so basically you can't trick anyone. You can't say, oh, I was out of the country because once they see that, they say, look, your phone's told us that you've been out of the country and therefore you need to do a 14 day quarantine and China makes it the building managers. So each building has like people that kind of manage the building or like oversee maintenance and things like that. And they put the power in those people to oversee the quarantines. So those, um, building managers are kind of held responsible. If I do run around and have the virus and, you know, infect other people, they're ultimately, you know, liable for that. And so it's kind of their, um, in their incentive to kind of make sure that I stay at home and, um, I could order food online. Like in, in China, it's very easy to order, uh, like groceries or stuff from the supermarket that comes the next day, but I literally can't leave my door. Um, and for 14 days, and I also had to provide uh, a temperature, uh, I had to take my temperature twice a day and report it to the building. And then they reported it to the local government every day. Um, and on day 10 and 14 of my quarantine, actually a doctor in a hazmat suit came to my apartment door and gave me a coronavirus test. So I got one on the 10th day and the 14th day. And I tested negative for both of them. And after that last day that I tested negative, I was free to uh, leave quarantine. Wow. That is very yeah. different than hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think it's important to know these differences. I don't want to make any conclusion for the viewers themselves, but at least they can see like what is happening in the U S and then what happened in China. And that's kind of why uh, China was able to slow the spread and, um, reduce the number of new cases through these very, very like stringent measures. And so if you look at the U S you'd probably argue that it's less stringent. And therefore I think that you're going to have uh, the virus stay a lot uh, around for longer and you'll probably have like a small outbreaks and then contractions continually before we get a vaccine, right? You're going to see, okay, every, everyone tightens down and then everything's okay. And then you let everyone run around and then you probably get another outbreak and then you kind of tighten it down again. And so I think, I think you'll probably see this throughout the rest of the year as these kind of, uh, contractions and expansion of the spread of the virus in the U S for sure. Yeah. Well, we definitely don't take that. Uh, we talk about mandatory quarantine. Everyone kind of, <laughs> everyone has a different definition of mandatory, I guess. We, um, I had to drive, literally just took a family road trip, but we didn't get out of the car. This is kind of a coronavirus road trip. You pack a lunch. We drove to New Hampshire last weekend, literally just kind of look around in the car, eat lunch in the car, turn back around and drive home. And part of that is this signs on the highway saying mandatory quarantine if you've been out of the state. But I'm thinking, how do they know? Like I could, you know, it's just a sign on the highway that says that. So there's nothing actually making you do it. It's just, we want you to do it is basically what they're telling you. But you are saying, you know, they check and it's, they really, like, you're not just kind of sneaking through at this point. It just kind of yeah, happens. Yeah. And I had, um, friend, I have a good friend in Shanghai and they actually put, um, like a magnet on his door and the magnet actually, uh, detects motion. So, wow. uh, on the outside of the door. So if you were to open the door, the government would know that you opened your door basically. Um, so those type of measures and they, they, they're, they're, they're extreme and, and you can argue that they could never happen in the U S because I think the population probably wouldn't accept it. But at the same time, like 
those were critical to helping them kind of slow the virus here. So it's 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 a huge difference when you look at the responses from from each country for sure. Yeah, well, in the U.S., I think it depends where you are, right? Um, being in Boston, for instance, Jersey, New York, they take it one level of seriousness, but then also have friends in Colorado, Florida, Texas, and you talk to them and total, just totally different outlook on how everything's happening right now. So I think it just depends on where you are in the country and, you know, we're getting hit a lot harder than someone in Alaska, right? So the U.S. is different when it comes to those sort of things as well. That's, that's amazing. What would happen? <laughs> yeah. So let's say these warehouses, right? Let's say you have a large logis- logistics facility and somebody tests positive for COVID there. Um, one of the employees, let's say you have a hundred employees sort of thing. What happens? Does the government step in? Do you shut down? Who tells you how long to be shut down for? What goes on there? Yeah. Yeah. We would have to shut down actually in the beginning when the, um, when they were starting to open up businesses in China, actually for the larger facilities, we're a, lar- we're a smaller facility, but anyone over a few hundred people, the government actually required them to rent or have an iso- like an, uh, an isolation room that if they were to have an infection, that they would have a room to put someone. So they would have to actually rent a room in a hotel nearby, keep it empty and have it prepared for the chance that one of their employees might be infected. And that company had to provide that space for that employee to, to isolate themselves for the period of time until they got better. And so the government actually required that from a lot of the big companies to, to kind of uh, commence operation. But if we were to have an infection at our facility, uh, the government would definitely shut us down. Um, they would require everyone to be tested uh, immediately and most likely go into quarantine immediately. So they would require probably a 14-day quarantine from any, anyone that was at the facility or visited the facility in the past two weeks. Um, we saw that happen in Guangzhou recently, which is a city near Shenzhen. And they had a few Starbucks employees that actually were um, uh, positive infect- infected. And they basically asked anyone that was at that Starbucks in the last 14 days, they were actually required by law to get tested. And if they didn't, that's actually a crime that that, that they were committing. Um, obviously, I'm sure there was probably some people that never, <laughs> never said anything and didn't go get tested. Um, but they would basically quarantine those people and test those people for COVID, uh, anyone that visited the store within 14 days. So that's the type of response that we're seeing from the government, uh, which is a pretty extreme <laughs> response. Yeah. Um, but um, I think it's relatively, you know, it's been effective for sure in in its um, ability to slow slow down the virus. So uh, everyone's still a little bit nervous. Also, imagine if you were at that Starbucks, uh, how even if you didn't have the virus, you're still <laughs> you still got to sit in your house for 14 days. So that's also not really an enjoyable um, time. But I, and I did it the first time, and I thought it was going to be tough, and it was. Um, it was kind of a learning experience for myself, to be honest. I mean, I've never sat in <laughs> in one room in my apartment for so long and never left. So it was quite a, quite an experience. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do they do, though, with the actual facility? Because let's say you have to quarantine everyone. Can you bring in another set of employees? Like, is there like... No, they shut it down. Okay. They shut down the Starbucks. So they... So they, the yeah, they building gets shut the, down. The, the building gets quarantined uh, as well as the not, people? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the the actual store got shut down for sure. I don't know if it's open yet, but they shut down the whole store, so they didn't allow anyone to to go in in it. And I'm sure they have to do some type of uh, you know disinfection of the facility before it's allowed to 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 you know restart. So yeah, so so that would be a normal um, type uh, reaction to any confirmed cases at a certain place in China for sure. How about when you start talking logistics, though, let's say you have, you know, a couple different shifts, right? You have your, you know, three different shifts, let's say, 500,000 square foot warehouse. What, but let's say someone there gets it. Does that whole warehouse have to now shut down for 14 days or just one shift has to, has to get quarantined? Like, what do you, what do they actually do with that warehouse? And does it just stop? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, we don't know anyone that's that has a warehouse that's been shut down. Luckily, uh, even our competitors. Um, but I assume that the government would require us to shut down. 
Um, I don't know how long. I would also assume it would be 14 days, unfortunately. And that's kind of, um, I guess you could say, the cost of doing business in China at this moment, which it's basically also incentivizing the people that run the facility to make sure that they're making the proper um, measures to ensure that their employees are safe and, and to ensure that, like, you know, people are not really spreading it to each other. And if you do that, then you can kind of keep doing business. Right. And so it's a little bit of a self, uh, policing. And, um, I know it sounds tough, but like, um, I think it's also a little bit different with, uh, just cultural and, um, in Asia, they're definitely more about the whole, you know, community, the whole society, and they care more about that. And so I saw a lot of Chinese people I knew that were actually quite happy to do the 14 day quarantine kind of for the good of society and for the good of the people around them. And they felt that like after they did that and after everyone did it, that overall you just have a safer environment to be around. And I, and I'd say that I do feel that as well. I, I can go outside now, I can go to eat, I can walk around and I feel comfortable doing it. And I think that's part of like, everyone kind of pitching in and doing what they can to like protect each other. So I think it's an interesting contrast, um, in, in culture that you see as well, playing, playing, a, playing a role, you know? Yeah. Super interesting. So one question that kind of comes to mind, um, and last question before I let you, let you go, but <laughs> where do you kind of see the opportunities, right? Where's the positive in all this that, you know, we mentioned it's easy to talk to a factory, you know, if we're talking, end of 2019 sort of thing, what would all of a sudden be possible today that wasn't possible six months ago? Yeah. So I think, um, for everyone that's doing e-commerce, this is definitely incredible for all of us, right? Because this is, a, this is basically forcing the trend we all knew that was happening, but forcing it much faster. And so, our, our warehouse, which only does e-commerce, uh, to give you an example, we're up in sales 300%. And I think that's a, a, a showing of not how good we did, but just how good the, the market is and how much people are buying online right now. And so um, for anyone that is in e-commerce, I think it's a good trend and the future is going to be bright. Um, at the moment, I think it's a good opportunity to look um, at products in China uh, specifically from factories that are smaller, that are having a, a tough time surviving. And you could definitely get lower order quantities. You can definitely get better prices at the moment. And you can get really hungry salespeople that are willing to like support you and kind of serve you to um, sell you their things. So I think that's definitely an opportunity. Um, and I think overall, like, it will improve through through the fact that more people are buying online. It will not only improve uh, the supply chain, so it'll improve the ability. You know, you'll probably have more ways to ship things. You'll probably have new different methods that come come about from it. But also, you'll probably be able to sell things that no one normally thought of to buy online, right? So I think a good thing is like. I don't think anyone's able to do this personally as a small seller, but a perfect example is like groceries, right? Like normally everyone goes to buy groceries. Um, but if you have this event where people don't want to go and people get used to just going online and buying all their groceries online, you create that habit that probably after the virus people will continue to do. And I think there's probably opportunities in other product categories that are similar to that that will open up a whole new market in e-commerce. I don't know what those are. Unfortunately, I can't give anyone the secret, but I'm sure that there are those type of opportunities that are coming about for sure. Yeah, that's a good point because I think there's a large number of baby boomers that maybe have never ordered online and all of a sudden in the past three months, this is just what they do. So it's like we've introduced entire generation to e-commerce within three months and that's like unprecedented. Yeah. Yeah. And they have a lot of money, right? So they're going to be spending a lot of their money online. Even my parents, like they're buying groceries online. They've never done that before. So once they have that account and once they start using it, I'm sure they'll use that account to buy other things as well. Yeah. And once I know it's not difficult or scary or, you know, your first time, if you go back, all of us, right? Your first time putting your credit card 
in on a website. It was just like experimental. Like, can I do this? Is some, you know, are they just going to like steal it? Like what's going to happen? And like, you know, we've got used to this as our generation, but there's a whole older generation that might not have done this yet, except for the past three months. It just happened all of a sudden. And now all of a sudden they've kind of come out of the woodwork. And I, so I think like what you're saying, we're entering at just a different time. And from this point forward, we're going to see e-commerce, you know, before you look at the numbers and it was only ever a small percent of total retail sales. And at even that percent going up, you know, there's all different numbers, right? 12%, 20, whatever that number, but it's not like, it's not like 99. And I think just going up a few percentage points changes the game for all of us out there and really just e-commerce in general. Right. So I think this is a big time for that. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Before I let you run, any kind of Anything you want to kind of tell more about the business, kind of what you guys actually do? Because I think it's super interesting, the whole um, logistics from China. That's something not a ton of people are yeah. doing, but it's a very interesting business. Yeah, so just to give people an idea of kind of what we do is we do two main types of businesses. So after you manufacture your product in China, uh, people send their products to our warehouse and typically we can ship it out in one of two ways. One is kind of traditional drop shipping where we ship the product from China to the end customer directly. And there's obviously a few different methods we can do that in. And then the second thing we do is we help Amazon sellers, uh, specifically people that sell through FBA, consolidate their freight, put it in containers or in air freight and ship it to any Amazon FBA warehouse around the world. So that's kind of our two main business models. And we, we also do a lot of the value add services that warehouses do. So that's kind of our main business. And we serve uh, e-commerce only generally. We don't really do much traditional um, like retail or anything like that. So if I'm a drop shipper, and I think we kind of touched upon this earlier, but why would I basically buy products, ship them to just a different warehouse in China to have them then drop shipped to the U.S. Um, you mentioned kind of the freight. Yeah. Is that kind of the big benefit of that? It's Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, one is for branding. So if you buy on AliExpress or you buy from some other people, um, usually there's no brand on it. There's no packaging on it. There's no like customization that's done. So a lot of our sellers, like they're bigger sellers, they care about their brand and their customer experience. And so they kind of make specialized products that have their branding, have their message, even have a note in their product. And then they send it to us. And and that's something that like the traditional uh, dropshipper on AliExpress can't do. Um, and the second is just like the speed of shipment and delivery. So we offer, like I said, direct line shipping and some other methods that you actually can't get on uh, AliExpress. And for, you know, sellers that are that care about that and care about their customer experience, uh, they like to choose that. So for our direct line, when it gets to the customer, you can't tell that it came from China. And I think that's one of the big benefits that um, customers don't like, you know, the sellers don't like their customer to know that it actually came from China. And so that benefit and the stability of the shipment is kind of attractive for larger uh, drop shippers. Yeah, you hear of all these stories. People start off AliExpress and they, you know, they order something, they send it. It takes like weeks to get there, and it shows, and they sell it for forty dollars, and it shows up with a packing slip in China with like two bucks on it, and yeah, the yeah, buyer yeah. freaks out, <laughs> and it's this very bad scene, and yep. you know they want their money back and all these things. So you basically take that all away, right? They just ship it to away, you. Yeah, yeah. You, you, rip, you rip all the the actual invoice out of the package, and then they can use their own packaging, like you said. Mi- put a flyer in there, logo, branding, anything like that. So basically gives the retail more control of the logistics experience. Yeah. And the shipment actually comes from a local U.S. address. So uh, when we freight it in, we actually drop it and ship it from a local address. So it looks like it's coming local in the U.S. So it's a different, let's say, feel when the customer receives it and they open up their package. Yeah, I can see it. I've done that before too. You order something, you see it and literally like, oh, okay, it's coming from and like. You see it coming from China and like, okay, yeah, it's very different yeah, yeah, yeah. than you're like, yeah, it comes from. It ruins, yeah, yeah, that feeling. It kind of takes a little bit out of your breath away a little bit in a bad way, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it makes you look at the product different. And yeah, if you think you're ordering this like higher end piece of electronics and then all of a sudden you see and you're like, and the packaging is a little janky, just, yeah, it changes the whole experience. And it probably allows you as a retailer to get repeat orders, kind of sell a little more. Just kind of treat the buyer a little differently at that point because you're putting a little more interest. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, and our customers usually can retain their customers 
better than your average dropshipper for sure. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I like that. Awesome. If people want to kind of see a little more about you, what you're working on, what can they do that? Yeah, sure. They can visit our website, so easychinawarehouse.com, or they can email me directly, not just about logistics, but anything about China, if you're interested, at brian, B-R-I-A-N, at easychinawarehouse.com. Awesome. I will link to that in the show notes. Thank you very much for coming Great. on today. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.